No.
hunt morning. Um, about an hour ago, we got a call from Bradley that he is not feeling well. And we also, last evening, got a call that our organist was not feeling well. So, we are on our own this morning, and we will carry on. So, <coughs> welcome and good morning. The flowers this morning are in honor of Sammy Johnson, and Sammy is my second great granddaughter. I usually refer to her as Sammy Lammy Ding Dong because she is cute and funny and cuddly, but she's also a ding dong sometimes, so I don't know if she likes that, but anyway, today is her third birthday. Um, and this week is 4th of July. So have a time on, July. on uh, Wednesday this week, we have midweek meditation, and you can look at that on YouTube. Um, and on Friday, we have a hybrid trustees meeting, and that's scheduled for 1.30 p.m. I want to let the book club people know that the book is in at the library, if you haven't already found that out. Um, just go in and... I would take at least 50 cents with me because sometimes they've charged us for um, the book. Apparently what she said to me was if the book club meets in the library, there's no charge. But if the book club meets somewhere else, there's the 50 cent charge. Okay. <laughs> that was never explained to me. I'm so, I'm, thank you. I'm very glad to know that. Um, last week we mentioned that um, an old-time member of Parma Greece um, had passed away. That was Larry Frisbee, and his obituary is in the suburban news this week, I, uh, the West Side News. I don't know if it's in the um, paper or not. But um, In terms of the food shelf needs this month, um, they're looking for juice boxes and things like that that the kids can um, partake of over the summer. But any contribution, do try to keep in the front of your head that in the summer those kids are not having access usually to um, uh, their lunches and things that they get in school. And so the, the traffic at the food shelf gets better or bigger and bigger. Um, Fortunately, Foodlink is very good with the city area and does a lot of lunches and things like that for um, programs, uh, but not so much out here, although Foodlink is very, very active out here also. So do try to remember to bring something each week when you come. Now, are there any other announcements that we need to make this morning? Okay. Remember, if you need pastoral support, right now you better call me or Mike Zabelski. Um, we'll give Pastor Bradley a break uh, and see if we can get him going again. Um, it is our hope that this service of worship and the weekly meditation provide you with some comfort and stability in this time of great uncertainty. Parma Greece United Church of Christ sharing God's love wherever we are. Now let us prepare our hearts, minds, and spirits for worship. Um, we are going to try to follow the order of worship as much as possible. However, we will not be having communion this morning. Um, that would be our usual, um, our usual pattern on the first of the month. And um, Mike Zabelski is going to be delivering um, Pastor Bradley's uh, uh, sermon for this morning. And we're going to sort of wing it when it comes to the hymns. And if you know them, sing along. <laughs> okay, any other announcements that I need to make before we get started? All right, we do have coffee and cake in the... Uh, for afterwards, so be sure that you join us in the back.
we will start with our call to worship. The Lord has turned our mourning into dancing. God has taken away our grief and reclothed us in joy. So that our whole being, body, mind, and soul, might sing praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, our Lord. Yay, <laughs> Gideon. We will give thanks to you forever. Thanks be to God. Let us worship together. Now, did we decide we could do the first hymn? Yeah, we're going to have a starting note, though. Okay. Ready? No. <laughs> Verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because the Lord has anointed me. 
He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. For the word of God in scripture. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 26 through 31. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble or noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are so that one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became, who became for us wisdom from God, the righteousness and satisfaction and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast of the Lord. For the word of God among us. Thanks be to God. Final reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet, and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, but if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha come, which means, little girl, get up. 
And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. For the word of God within us. Praise to you, O Christ. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, while Pastor Bradley is not with us today, he sends his words along, and I will attempt to offer them in like manner. Our Gospel reading today is one of those passages of Scripture that I could probably teach and preach through from different angles for about a month or so, says Pastor Bradley. I think it would take four messages or thereabouts to cover everything that is referenced and proclaimed by this passage. So, I will endeavor to do with this message is to cover one thing, one angle from which we can approach this reading. Be aware that although the scripture does in fact say what I'm about to going to speak to you about, it also says other things. In order for us to gain some insight into all that is going on here and to be able to zoom in on the part we want to see today, I need to do a bit of unpacking by way of explanation. First, we should consider that this passage of scripture employs quite a few storytelling methods and therefore ought to be read metaphorically. That is to say, Believe whatever you want about whether it really happened like this, but relating history simply isn't the point here. The point is to communicate by way of allegory, reference, and metaphor, truth about Jesus that has been effectively hidden in plain sight. He who has ears, let him hear, and she who has eyes, let her see. This is how the Gospels often function. What devices are employed here? You'll notice that the woman has been bleeding for 12 years, and the daughter in the synagogue ruler was 12 years old. This is a device meant to lead us to see them as types of ancient Israel. There were 12 sons of Jacob who became the 12 tribes of Israel. For the same reason, Jesus chose 12 apostles. The comparison is clear. Also, there is some wordplay being used. The synagogue leader asked Jesus to save his daughter, and the woman who touches Jesus' clothes asks, says to herself, if I touch him, I will be saved. When Jesus speaks to her, he says, daughter, your faith has saved you. We are meant by observing this wordplay to see these two intersecting stories as mirroring each other. They are two looks at the exact same thing. Looking at one story then will help us to understand the other. The easier story to interpret is the story about the woman with the issue of the bleeding. This is a story about ceremonial uncleanliness and the burden of guilt and the weight of sin laid on people's shoulders by the laws surrounding it. The book of Leviticus, which is our, in our Bible and in the Hebrew Torah, actually addresses this exact situation. It says that if a woman, quote unquote, has a discharge of her blood for many days, for all the days of her impure discharge, she is unclean. Then when it stops, if it stops, she has to count sev off seven more days, then on the eighth day go and offer a sacrifice for the sin of her impurity, and then and only then will she be clean. To be unclean in a society that made a distinction between holy and the profane, between the clean and the unclean, was to be a pariah. Anyone she touched became unclean as well. Anything she touched became unclean. If she were to sleep with anyone, they would become unclean for seven days. That meant that she was treated basically like a leper in ancient Israel, an unclean one, infectious and contagious. She would not set foot inside the temple or frequent public places or go inside another person's home. She was, for all intents and purposes, an outcast. And what is more, there is nothing she could do about it. Nothing, that is, until Jesus came along and gave her hope. She came to believe that if she merely touched his clothes, she would be made well. But you understand now, to touch Jesus intentionally would be a sin. 
it would be a violation of several purity laws which could be punishable by death at worst, but more likely formal banishment from the community and excommunication from the temple, regardless of whether she was made clean or not. But she presses through the crowd, comes up behind Jesus, reaches out, and touches his clothes nonetheless. But her ordeal was not yet over. Jesus knew what had happened. He felt power go out from him, and he knew something had touched him. He stopped in his tracks and refused to take another step until she presented herself. That's why the scripture says that she related her story having fallen before him with fear and trembling. She thought maybe this great day was about to go bad. But of course, Jesus' response releases her from that fear and that trembling. Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your disease. Jesus granted her peace and affirmed her healing without laying on her the burden of managing her cleanliness. He disregarded those laws the same as she did. The power that came out from Jesus was so effective that not only did it heal the woman's disease, it obliterated even the concept of cleanliness. In the end, there ceased to be such a thing as uncleanliness. The ugliness of that ordeal was wiped away forever. But maybe it didn't look that way from the point of view of the synagogue ruler and his entourage. They heard the woman's story and saw what she'd done. They had firsthand knowledge now that Jesus was unclean too. The unclean woman had touched him. It seems very convenient that at that precise moment, the peanut gallery shows up saying that Jesus doesn't need to come to the house anymore. If Jesus entered the house, both it and everything else he touched would become unclean. Not a good look for a synagogue leader. Jesus saw the ruse as well. He saw that they were willing to let a girl die in order to preserve meaningless and spiritually non-existent laws. He saw that they would prioritize ritual over righteousness. He sees right through all of this. So they come to the leader's home. People are wailing and grieving outside, having been told that the child was dead. But Jesus knew better. The child was not dead. They were outside wailing and grieving for her, but he knew, he saw, he believed that she was not actually dead, and he was right. Mark's account implies strongly that she was not in fact dead. It says that Jesus took her hand, spoke to her, and she popped right up and began to walk around, like a 12-year-old waking up from a nap with a startle might do. Nothing was out of the ordinary since she really wasn't dead. Remember that in the previous story, Jesus demonstrated that there was no such thing as uncleanliness, that it was a man-made, made-up idea whose time was up. Jesus summarily disposed of it with power. In this story, what then does Jesus demonstrate? What does he show us is a man-made-up idea? What concept does he destroy? Simply this. Jesus demonstrated that here that the burden of sin brought on by the belief that one is existentially unclean is propped up and reinforced by none other than the power of death. Jesus shows us that the power of death itself is a man-made up as a made-up idea, a man-made invention. Jesus destroys the concept that death or sin or the laws that bring them to bear have any power over us whatsoever. They are exposed here as spiritual non-entities, meaningless guises whose ruse we need not fall for any longer. Let us today be reminded that because we are in Christ, because Christ has embraced us and we have embraced him in return, we are indeed set free, saved, healed, and loved. Where we feel that we are broken, Christ offers healing. Where we feel we are bound, Christ offers salvation. Where we feel rejected and unclean before God, Christ offers unconditional love. Let's not fall for that ruse any longer. Let's not accept the delusion that death or sin hold any power over us. The love of Christ has obliterated them both. Sons and daughters of God, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and behold, the kingdom of God is not dead, nor does it sleep. 
I say to you, arise. Amen, and thanks be to God. So we've come to the part of our service where we bless our gifts. Um, and as Pastor Bradley reminds us, the gifts are many, not just financial, but all of the other things that people do around this wonderful place. So, <clears throat> join me, please. Gracious God, let us give our gifts like the woman in the crowd who touched the hem of Jesus' garment with trust, knowing that you will take what we offer and fill it with your own life. Receive our gifts, O God, and bless them, we pray. May they speed the coming of your kingdom in our community. Amen. Our singers. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. the prayers of the people and I do have a list this morning and as I finish the list if you have any additions that you would like to make please speak up so we do have some joys um, Sammy's birthday is certainly a joy for us and for everyone um, we have um, a, a cousin of Jesse's her name is Deborah and she was just um, given the woman of distinction award um, for her work with Moms Demand Action. It's a gun control program in, um, I believe, in Rochester. Well, it's all over. Okay. Yes. okay. So that's a, a joy. Um, that we will say prayers for. In terms of illnesses, um, Sherry is off with her parents again and her mother is not doing well at all so we sent prayers for Barb and Bob and for Sherry. We have some people who are stressed um, Gary, Nicole and Matthew and Lynn and Pam's grandson Evan and Imogen and his girlfriend Imogen who are stranded somewhere in the United States trying to get from Rochester, Minnesota to Rochester, New York. After, so After traveling from Auckland, New Zealand. <laughs> um, from our website, um, we have some prayers also, all affected by the recent Supreme Court decisions, and we've had um, some rather controversial decisions made recently, um, very recently and then just not a little while back. Essential workers, nurses, and certainly the people of Ukraine. And then we pray for the family and friends of Jim Wegman who passed this week. So, <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. And now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and deliver us from it, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, since Pastor Bradley is not with us this morning, we will have communion at another time this month. So we come to, are we going to do Precious Lord? Good, we have some musical people here, so we will stand and do our closing hymn, which is Precious Lord, Take My Hand. benediction. May you leave today confident in God's steadfast love for you. We are, we are sure in Christ. May you know the freedom of the children of God that is granted to us by God's Spirit. Trusting the Spirit, we are made whole. Now our service is ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. We do have coffee and tea and cake for refreshment.